स्वामी नाम ने नमस्ते सरस्वती देवे घोरवाणी प्रचारी ने निर्विशेष शून्यवादी पश्चात्य देश तारी ने पंच कौपातर कृपा सिंधु बाये बचा पति तम भवानेभ्यो वैष्णवेभ्यो नमो नम जय श्री कृष्ण चैतन्य प्रभो निनंद श्री हद्वैत गाधार श्रीवास दिगोर भक्तवृंद हरे कृष्ण हरे कृष्ण 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे हरे सो वेलकम एवरी वन टू आर स्टडी श्रीमद भागवतम वे आर स्टडी इन कैंटो थ्री टीचिंग सप्लर कपिला एंड टूडे वे आर ऑन चैप्टर नंबर थर्टी वन दिस इज स्टडिंग एट द लेवल ऑफ भक्ति बाई बा So, who remembers yesterday? What would be yesterday? We spoke about the mode of ignorance. We were hearing about the mode of ignorance and how living entity has to go through different conditions of life. So, who can tell us? something about what we studied yesterday what do you remember sundarananda prabhu sundarananda prabhu what do you remember from yesterday we were describing the movements of the living entity lila mai lila mai rukmini krishna maharaj amaraj we discussed about the different types of vairagya so we saw ayukta vairagya markata vairagya palgu vairagya smashan vairagya okay when we saw what the different types of people do when they come across money in that discussion uh, just to understand the different types of vairagya and how they react to that okay we spoke about vairagya yesterday yes hari krishna maharaj hari krishna prabhu maharaj please accept my humble obeisances um we saw we saw yesterday how uh one gets entangled in family life Yes. And when they get entangled, then uh, they are in actually a diseased condition, where they can. It's difficult to come out of it. Okay. Are you in family life yourself? No, Maharaj. Oh, very good. So you're a free man. Yes, we spoke about family life, and the effects of family life. Actually, Lord Kapila is replying to Devahuti's question, right? What did Devahuti want to know about? The power of time, Maharaj. Yes, right. The effects of time, and how the effects of time, how time decays everything. Here in the material world, we're all under the influence of time. so time is a very valuable thing we have to use it very very carefully make the best use of every moment for the highest purpose and then we heard also about birth and death right devahuti wanted to understand more about the nature of birth and death it will help her to become more detached from the material world so lord kapila described about first of all he described about how the living entity becomes very entangled working very hard making money even by dishonest means 
doing everything to get money, trying to satisfy people, could never get enough money. And then finally the man dies and he's taken by the Yamaduts. And the Yamaduts take him to Yamaraj and he's punished in hell. And then after punishing and being punished in hell, then he gets a, an animal body, comes back gradually and gradually he comes back to the human form of life. So that's where we are today. We're going to hear today about more about the mode of passion. We were hearing about the mode of ignorance yesterday. Today we're going to hear more about the mode of passion. Let's see. Right? Okay. Oh, let me see. Wait. I have to share it with you, right? <laughs> share the screen. Okay. Is it all right? Are you clear? Yes, Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj. Yes, Good. Yes, Maharaj. All right. The movements. The movements of the living entities. Chapter 31. Let's glorify Srimad Bhagavatam. O Srimad Bhagavatam, O nectar churned from the ocean of all scriptures, you are the most prominent transcendental fruit of the Vedas, enriched with the jewels of all conclusive truths. You grant spiritual vision to all the people of the world. O life breath of the Vaishnava devotees, O Lord, you are the sun which has risen to dispel the darkness of Kali Yuga. You are actually Lord Krishna who has returned among us. O Srimad Bhagavata, I offer my respectful obeisances unto you. By your recitation one attains transcendental bliss because your syllables shower pure love of God upon the reader. You are always to be served by everyone, for you are an incarnation of Lord Krishna. O Srimad Bhagavatam, O my only friend, O my companion, O my teacher, O my great wealth, O my deliverer, O my good fortune, O my bliss, I offer my respectful obeisances unto you. O Srimad Bhagavatam, O bestower of saintliness to the unsaintly, O uplifter of the most fallen, please don't ever leave me. Accompanied by pure love of Krishna, please manifest yourself in my heart and in my throat. Okay, so we're going to begin the class today with a, a song. Well, I'm not going to sing it, but we're going to read it. A very interesting song, very relevant to this topic, sung by, given to us by Bhaktivinoda Thakur, beautiful Bengali poetry. We'll read the translation. O Lord, having forgotten you and come to this material world, I have experienced a host of sins and sorrows. Now I approach your lotus feet and submit my tale of woe. All right, so this is the song, Bulia Tomari, Forgetting You. Bulia Tomari Samsari Asiya Pe Nana Vida Bhyata. Tomara Charani Asiyachi Ami Bolibo Dukena Bolibo Dukera Kata. Dukehera Kata. I, I haven't sung this song before, but it's relevant to what we're studying, so we'll put it here in the slide. So Bhaktivinoda Thakur is describing how the living entity, how we take birth, how we come into this world, what is our consciousness. 
Bhaktivinoda says, when I was bound up tightly in the unbearable confines of my mother's womb, O Lord, you once revealed yourself before me. After appearing briefly, you abandoned this poor servant of yours. So we we'll hear about this, a living entity in the womb. Some living entities, they're blessed, they get they're able, they're able to offer prayers or they may even see the Lord. So Bhaktivinoda says, you once revealed yourself before me, appearing briefly. Because suffering so much that the Lord appears. At that moment I thought, after my birth, this time I will surely worship you with undivided attention. But, alas, after taking birth, I fell into the entangling network of worldly illusions. Thus I possessed not even a drop of true knowledge. So the child in the womb prays to the Lord. The uh, Lord even appear, may appear briefly I will pray that definitely after my birth I'm going to worth I will worship you. But then after we get out of the womb, we take birth, we come into the material world, then we forget everything. We lose it. It's all forgotten. As a dear son fondled in the laps of attentive relatives, I pass my time smiling and laughing. The affection of my father and mother helped me forget you still more, and I began to think that the material world was a very nice place. Yeah, this is what happens, you see, you take birth, father and mother give so much affection, and we think, well, this is not so bad here. Day by day, I gradually grew into a young boy, began playing with other boys. Soon my powers of understanding emerged, so I diligently studied my school lessons every day. Proud of my accomplished education, I later traveled from place to place and earned much wealth, thereby maintaining my family with undivided attention, I forgot you, O Lord Hari. So, you grow up, you go to school, you get education, somebody may be successful, do very well in their education. After education, they, they earn money, they have a family, and they're, they're not thinking about God. He's forgotten. But now, in old age, this Bhaktivinod very sadly weeps as death approaches. I failed to worship you, O Lord, and instead passed my days in vain. What will be my fate now? Ekon ki habe gati. Napajia tore dina brita jelo ekon ki habigati. What will be my fate now? Where will I go? This is the position of the living entity. Okay, so chapter 25, we heard from Devahuti, and Devahuti was in trouble. Her husband had gone away and left her. He's taking sannyas. Devahuti was very disturbed. She's left with her son. The daughters were all married and she was left with her son, Lord Kapila. So she confesses to him, I am bewildered by Maya. Please take away my illusion. So Lord Kapila instructs her. Of course, she also asks, what kind of bhakti should I perform to attain you? Explain the process of jnana and yoga. How many limbs do they have? So these were her questions. Then chapter 26, 
we analyze the different elements of material nature, the characteristics, so that's all the path of Gyan. Then chapters 27 and 28, the method of liberation, making use of this knowledge to get liberation. And it was also explained the difference between the jiva and prakriti, the limbs of the astanga yoga, description of the Lord's pastimes, or description of the Lord's form for performing dharana, right? 28 was the astanga yoga. So you have to, you have to meditate on the different bodily limbs of the Lord. So, yamniyam, asan praniyam, pratyaharana, dharana, that's the sixth step. Dharana leads to dhyana and then samadhi. So dharana, concentration on the different bodily limbs of the Lord. Then chapter 29, we, Devahuti asks, tell me about the path of bhakti. And we spoke about the different kinds of bhakti and how People may be influenced by the modes of nature and doing bhakti, bhakti, by bhakti done in the mode of passion, bhakti done in the mode of goodness, in the mode of ignorance. So Devahuti wanted to know also about pure bhakti. Pure bhakti, that's described by Rupa Goswami and Nectar of Devotion. So that was chap up to chapter 29. So, Devahuti continues, My dear Lord, please also describe in detail, both for me and for people in general, the continual process of birth and death. For by hearing of such calamities, we may become detached from the activities of this material world. So we're going to hear what happens at the time of birth, what happens even before birth, and what happens with death, before death and after death, what happens. We heard a little yesterday, we heard about the Yamaduras coming, taking the soul to Yamaloka. We heard this not very pleasant, so much suffering. The living entity suffers in the womb, suffers after birth, he suffers before death, he suffers after death. All suffering in this world. There's no happiness, but there's the illusion of happiness. So this is the problem. So Devahuti wanted to know about the process of birth and death. She said also, please describe eternal time, which is a representation of your form and by whose influence people in general engage in the performance of pious activities. Yeah, we see people do pious activities, especially in their older age. They know they're coming nearer to death. They want to leave, they want to do something good before they leave the body. So maybe they've made a lot of money, they've done a lot of sinful things, and they like to atone for their sins. They do some charity before they leave the world. So coming on to chapter 31, chapter 30 was describing the mode of ignorance. We're going to hear today about the mode of passion. And begins, first of all, well, chapter 30 finished, the soul was going to take birth again. He came to the human form of life. After going to Yamaloka and suffering, then he went in the animal bodies. Now he's come back to the human form of life. And we're going to hear about how he suffers in the mother's womb. Before he takes his birth, he has to go in the womb, he has to live in the womb for nine months. And there's, a, we will hear about prayers by the embryo in the womb, how the child in the womb offered prayers to the Lord. But then, after birth, then 
forgetfulness. It's all forgotten. Just like we read, we sang that, we heard that song, Bhaktivinoda Thakur said, forgetting you. We forget Krishna. As soon as we take birth, all forgotten. Then Lord Kapila has something to say about association. He's going to warn us what is good and what is bad association. And we have to be very careful of bad association. And the final section describes how to get back one's eternal nature. That's what we really want to do. So the first verse, famous verse. Karanam daiva netrena jantur deho papataye. Right? This is often quoted by Prabhupada. That the living entity takes his birth under the supervision of the Supreme Lord and according to his karma. Karmana daiva netrena jantur deho papataye. It's all done like that. It's not by chance, but under the supervision and according to the results of our work, our karma. The living entity is made to enter into the womb of a woman through the particle of male semen to assume a particular type of body. So the body we have today is the result of that. It's the result of that karmana daiva netrena jantur deho papati. According to our karma and the, under the supervision of the Supreme Lord. Not by chance. So we're going to hear about Vedic embryology, the growth of the child in the womb, how it's described in the Vedas. Right? The, the man and woman unite, and if they're fortunate, generally people when they unite, they want to have a child. That should be the intention in the Vedic culture. Husband and wife, they will join together to produce a child. So on the first night, the sperm and the ovum mix. And on the fifth night, the mixture ferments into a bubble. On the tenth night, it develops into a form like a plum. And after that, it gradually turns into a lump of flesh or an egg, as the case may be. All of this, this is given in Srimad Bhagavatam, all described like this. You can see, first night, the fifth night, the tenth night, the stages which is going through. So gradually it turns into a lump of flesh or maybe an egg depending where, where the living entity is taking birth. If it's going to be born in the bird family, then be born in an egg. Then, in the course of a month, a head is formed. And at the end of two months, the hands, feet, other limbs take shape. By the end of three months, nails, fingers, toes, bodily hair, bones and skin appear, as do the organ of generation and the other apertures in the body, namely the eyes, nostrils, ears, mouth and anus. So now, from a few days it's become a month, and then two months, and then three months. By three months, these different features of the body are all beginning to develop. So, the mothers who have conceived, they have to check, they go to the doctors, and the doctors can check, is the child going to be normal, is everything okay with the child, is the body developing okay? Then Srimad Bhagavatam goes on to describe, after now four months, Four months from the date of conception, 
the seven essential ingredients of the body, namely chile, blood, flesh, fat, bone, marrow and semen come into existence. At the end of five months, hunger and thirst make themselves felt. And at the end of six months, the fetus enclosed by the amnion begins to move on the right side of the abdomen. So, how detailed information is given. You can see the, the nature of the Srimad Bhagavatam, the Vedic science, that is giving very specific, detailed information on the growth of the child within the womb. Four months, five months, six five months hunger and thirst and at the end of six months then the child begins to move onto the right side. So this is, this information is all just given in Srimad Bhagavatam and it's a very powerful preaching tool to establish the authority of the Srimad Bhagavatam and the Vedas in general and how Vedic science is related to modern science. Modern science have only in recent times been able to confirm the growth of the child within the womb. But the information which modern science got is almost exactly the same as the Vedic conclusions. There's no difference. We say, however, the first the first, the Vedic version, is based on scriptural revelation, whereas the latter, modern science, depends on empirical observation, using microscopes, ultrasound, and last generation 3D scanning, these kind of things. So, but the fact is, the advancement of modern technology broadens the limits of human sensory perception, simply come to confirm the authenticity of Vedic revelation. The Vedas have already taught us all this information. Only just recently, with all their technology, they were able to confirm the information which was already given there in our scriptures. So, this is very powerful preaching evidence to people that they wonder, is, it, is this all true, is this factual? Just like we tell them things like, Lord Buddha, the appearance of Lord Buddha was predicted. Lord Buddha came. And so here, the development of the child within the womb, very powerful. We explain to people, Chant Hare Krishna. By chanting Hare Krishna, you get free of passion and ignorance. You can come to the mode of goodness. Very important. Come to the mode of goodness. Get rid of the lower modes of nature. So gradually, people are beginning to have some respect for the Vedic culture. That This information is all given here. So, we have information about the development of the body. The Srimad Bhagavatam also tells us about the suffering, the unpleasant condition which is there within the mother's womb. Text number five describes about the child within the womb, how he gets food. Because we said after five months he's feeling hunger and thirst. So the mother has to be careful that she's not feeding just one, she's not just feeding herself, she's also feeding the child within her womb. So from the, from the text number five, deriving its nutrition from the food and drink taken by the mother, the fetus grows and remains in that abominable residence of stools and urine, which is the, the breeding place 
of all kinds of worms. Yeah, within the body there's many living entities and often there's worms also within the body. We see when a person dies, if the body is not burned, we see the worms come out from the body. Then text number six describes bitten again and again all over the body by the hungry worms in the abdomen itself. The child suffers terrible agony because of his tenderness. He thus becomes unconscious moment after moment because of that terrible condition. So, so much suffering. The unfortunate child is within the womb in a very difficult condition, twisted, bent over, cannot move. It's, and the skin, of course, the skin is very tender. We, we know young, young babies, they have very tender skin. We have to, when the, after the child is born and the mothers, they have to do things to help the child's skin to become less sensitive. So the child is suffering, sometimes going unconscious. People, of course, are not always appreciative that there's so much suffering there. Sometimes the mother will eat hot, spicy food. Maybe she likes very spicy food. And when she will eat the spicy food, then the, the spices will burn the body of the skin, the skin of the, the baby. So pregnant women, they have, they're supposed to follow special diets. They're not supposed to take just anything, have to be very careful, but sometimes the mothers are not able to control and they take food which they're not supposed to. And the result is the child suffers, the child in the womb suffers, and there'll be some permanent damage done to the skin of the child. At the time of the birth of the child, it may have some birthmark maybe due to something the mother ate during her pregnancy. Described here, owing to the mother's eating bitter, pungent foodstuff or food which is too salty or too sour, the body of the child incessantly suffers pains which are almost intolerable. material world is like that. So many pains. But people are not thinking suffering. One devotee came to see Prabhupada and he brought his mother. And so the lady came in and she spoke to Prabhupada. She said, oh, it's so hot outside. Oh, it's so terrible. And Prabhupada began to speak about how so much suffering is there in the material world. And when Prabhupada began to speak about suffering, then she said, no, no, it's not so bad. I don't think it's so bad. I don't think we're so bad. But then Prabhupada said to her, but just a few minutes ago you were telling me you were suffering. And now you're saying it's not so bad. So this is what happens. This is the nature of the material world. That we're suffering one minute, but we get a little bit of enjoyment and we forget everything. A little comfortable and everything's, all the suffering is forgotten. This is the nature, material world. Little bits of pleasure. Lochan Das says, Chapala Sukha. Just to get some flickering pleasure, we accept so much suffering. More descriptions of the child within the womb. Placed within the abdomen and covered outside by the intestines, the child remains lying on one side of the abdomen, his head turned towards his belly and his back and neck 
arched like a bow. Back and neck arched like a bow, his head turned down towards his belly. Very uncomfortable position. The child thus remains, just like a bird in a cage, without freedom of movement. At that time, if the child is fortunate, he can remember all the troubles of his past 100 births and he grieves wretchedly. What is the possibility of peace of mind in that condition? If there's no peace of mind, then there can be no happiness. There's no possibility of being happy if you don't have peace of mind. So no movement, very restricted, and then you remember the previous births, 100 births. This, these are not going to be human birth, but birth in many different species of life. So much suffering. Text number 10 says, thus endowed with the development of consciousness from the seventh month, after his conception, the child is tossed downward by the airs that press the embryo during the weeks preceding delivery. Like the worms born of the same filthy abdomen cavity, he cannot remain in one place. So this is the child getting ready to come out from the womb. Is tossed down, should be in the right situation. After birth, the child may forget about the difficulties of his past lives, but when we are grown up, we can at least understand the grievous tortures undergone at birth and death by reading the authorized scripture like Srimad Bhagavatam. If we do not believe in the scriptures, that is a different question. But if we, but if we have faith in the authority of such descriptions, then we must prepare for our freedom in the next life. That is possible in this human form of life. One who does not take heed of these indications of suffering in human existence is said to be undoubtedly committing suicide. Undoubtedly committing suicide. And uh, you've wasted the life. So we have to recognize these conditions, how much suffering there is in this existence in the material world. And we should want to finish the suffering, no more birth and death, right? This, this is the purpose of Krishna consciousness, Bhakti Yoga, to get us out from this world. We have to apply this knowledge. If we have to come back again, it means we have failed. Makunda Maharaj edited that book, uh, Coming Back, The Science of Reincarnation. The last chapter is called, Don't Come Back. We don't want to come back. That is the real purpose of Bhakti Yoga. No more birth. Prabhupada said, devotees, what is the most important verse in the Bhagavad Gita? What verse do you think they said? Anybody like to guess? Yes? This coming back is about the reincarnation and it has wonderful stories. After the Jadabharat story, Chitrakit story, Chitrakit is his son's story. 
So stating how that the this, uh, regarding the Chitraketu son, you will be saying that I have been there for so many lifetimes, but I don't know who, which father you are. Yeah, but you're not answering my question. What is the most important verse in the Bhagavad Gita? Sorry. Is it Dehi Nosmin Yata Dehi? No. Karma Karma Chami Dibya. Yes. That's right. Janma Karma Chami Dibya. Why is it the most important verse? Krishna Maharaj because Punar Janmana Vidyati. Right. Because uh, we will not come back to this material world again. That's right. Very good. Yes. One who understands Krishna's birth and activities to be transcendental, then upon giving up this body, they never have to take birth again. So that is the goal. We want to achieve that. We don't want to continue the suffering in this human existence. That's the point. It is said that this human form of life is the only means for crossing over the nations of maya or material existence. We have a very efficient boat in this human form of body and there is a very expert captain the spiritual master. The scriptural injunctions are like favorable winds. If we do not cross over the ocean of the nations of material existence, in spite of all these facilities, then certainly we are all intentionally committing suicide. Yes, a great waste if we don't take advantage of the facilities. The scriptures are there, the guru is, are there, the boat is there. We have the boat, we have the association, we have everything we need. We just need to apply the process. If we don't take advantage, it's just like committing suicide. This is from text number nine. Okay, coming into the chapter, hearing about the living entity in the womb. The living entity in this frightful condition of life, bound by seven layers of material ingredients, prays with folded hands, appealing to the Lord who has put him in that condition. So we're going to hear the prayers of the living entity in the womb. What maybe maybe some of you know, you've already read them. What what are some what does the living entity in the womb how did it, how does it pray to the Lord? Anybody? Sorry, Krishna like you have said in the beginning of the class, Bodhya Kumara. So in that Bhaktana talk is saying that uh, he is praised to the Lord that somehow relieve me from this suffering, I will always remember you and worship you. Yes. Yeah, he prays to the Lord that if, if you let me out, certainly I will worship you. Hmm. Text number 12 says, the human soul says, I take shelter of the lotus feet of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who appears in his various eternal forms and walks on the surface of the world. I take shelter of him only because he can give me relief from all fear and from him I have received this condition of life which is just befitting my impious activities. So this is a very enlightened human soul who's praying like this. 
because they, they've, they've understood that the condition of life which they're in is the result of their sinful activities, their impious activities. And they're recognizing also the Lord, that he appears in various eternal forms and he walks also on the world. Text 13 goes on, I, the pure soul, appearing now bound by my activities, am laying in the womb of my mother by the arrangement of Maya. I offer my respectful obeisances unto him, who is also here with me, but who is unaffected and changeless. He is unlimited, but he is perceived in the repentant heart. To him I offer my respectful obeisances. So the soul is pure, but we're put into these unfortunate conditions by the arrangement of maya. Forgetting Krishna, right? We forgot Krishna, so we come in contact with maya. We come under the control of maya. But the living entity is remembering the Lord. I offer my obeisances unto him, who is also here with me, but who is unaffected and changeless. Just like we were asked yesterday, does the super soul also go to hell with us? When we go to hell, is the super soul Paramatma also? Yes, he's also there, but he's unaffected, he's changeless. He is unlimited and he is perceived by the repentant heart. We should be repentant, we should feel very so sorry that we have come into this material world and that we've been so neglectful, we've been so sinful, we've wasted so much time when we did not worship him. Text 14, I am separated from the Supreme, from the Supreme Lord because of my being in this material body made of five elements and therefore my qualities and senses are being misused, although I am essentially spiritual. Because the Supreme Personality of Godhead is transcendental to material nature and the living entities, because he is devoid of such a material body, because he is always glorious in his spiritual qualities, I offer my obeisances unto him. So these are very enlightened prayers. You can see he's understood the position of the Supreme Lord, how he's completely transcendental to everything, and how he's misused his own senses. But he understands himself also to be spiritual, that he's also a soul. So purport, text 13, Prabhupada said, it is said here, Atapyamana ridaye vishitam. He is in the heart of every living entity, but he can be realized only by a, a soul who is repentant. The individual soul becomes repentant that he forgot his position, wanted to become one with the Supreme Soul and tried his best to lord it over material nature. He has been baffled. He's been baffled. He's been defeated. He couldn't do it. He tried to become lord. He couldn't. So he was... And therefore, he is repentant. He feels very sorry that he did these foolish things. He tried to conquer over the material energy, but he failed. Then the prayers continue. The human soul further prays, the living entity is put under the influence of material nature and continues a hard struggle for existence on the path of repeated birth and death. This conditional life is due to his forgetfulness of his relationship with the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Therefore, without the Lord's mercy, 
how can he again engage in the transcendental loving service of the Lord? So, hard struggle for existence, birth and death, all due to forgetfulness. We forget Krishna and we're put un into these different conditions. So we need to get the Lord's mercy to take advantage, to get freed from this situation. To get the Lord's mercy, we have to do devotional service. We have to engage. Text 16, no one other than the Supreme Personality of Godhead as the, the localized Paramatma, the partial representation of the Lord, is directing all inanimate and animate objects. He is present in the three phases of time, past, present, future. Therefore, the conditioned soul is engaged in different activities by his direction. And in order to get free from the threefold miseries of conditioned life, we have to surrender unto him. So, now the prayer is describing about the Paramatma who is there with him in the womb. So, the conditioned soul doing different activities is under the direction of the Super Soul. Bhagavad Gita Krishna describes how the Super Soul is the overseer, the permitter of activity. From him comes knowledge, remembrance and forgetfulness. So he's inspiring the conditioned soul to act according to his desire. So in order to get free, from the miseries, we have to surrender. Text 17, fallen into a pool of blood, stool and urine within the abdomen of his mother, his own body scorched by the mother's gastric fire, the embodied soul, anxious to get out, counts his months and prays, O oh my Lord, when shall I, a wretched soul, be released? from this confinement. So it prays to get out. Arguments may be put forward as to why we have been put under the influence of this material energy by the supreme will of the Lord. This is explained in Bhagavad Gita where the Lord says, I am seated in everyone's heart and due to me, one is forgetful or one is alive in knowledge. The forgetfulness of the conditioned soul is also due to the direction of the Supreme Lord. Yeah, the Lord inspires us to forget so that we can enjoy the situation which we wanted within our own mind due to our conditioned state of existence, we're put into these material bodies. And we're actually thinking, it's very nice. Prabhupada explains, a living entity misuses his little independence when he wants to lord it over material nature. This misuse of independence, which is called maya, is always available. Otherwise, there would be no independence. Independence implies that one can use it properly or improperly. It is not static. It is dynamic. Therefore, misuse of independence is the cause of being influenced by maya. Right? Independence. Prabhupada said proper or improper. What is proper use of our independence? Someone like to describe for us? Service of Krishna. Yes, independence means to take shelter of Krishna. That's proper use. And the improper use? We use our uh, for enjoyment, for material enjoyment. Yes, to forget Krishna. 
So we have that choice every time. Prabhupada said, Maya is so strong that the Lord says it is very difficult to surmount her influence. But one can do so very easily if he surrenders unto me. Anyone who surrenders unto him can overcome the influence of the laws of material nature. It is clearly said here that a living entity is put under the influence of maya by his will. And if, we, if one wants to get out of this entanglement, can be made possible simply by his mercy. So, we want to get free of maya, we have to get the mercy of Krishna. Maya is under is Krishna's energy. So if we surrender to Krishna, then Krishna will release us from the energy. We just have to make proper proper use. Text 16. As the super soul is seated within the heart of the living entity, when the living entity is serious, the Lord directs him to take shelter of his representative a bona fide spiritual master. Directed from within, guided externally by the spiritual master, one attains the path of consciousness, which is the way out of the material clutches, and one's life is blessed. So, like that, we're in the womb, we're in this miserable condition, and the super soul is there with us and when we take shelter of the super soul then the Lord can direct us to make it so much easier for us on this path. Just to finish these prayers, My dear Lord, by your causeless mercy I am awakened to consciousness. Although I am only 10 months old, you understand 10 months from the day of conceiving within the womb, people think that, oh, the child is not born yet, so it's okay, we can kill it. But here in these prayers, the beginning of the life of the child is from the time of conception. So the child is 10 months old. For this causeless mercy of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the friend of all fallen souls, there's no way to express my gra gratitude but to pray with folded hands. Ten months old, so in other words, now it's time for the child to come out of the womb. So he's praying with folded hands. Text number 19, living, the living entity in another type of body sees only by instinct. He knows only the agreeable and disagreeable sense perceptions of that particular body. Animals like that, they, can, they, they, they don't have the same facility as we have in the human body. But he describes here, but I have a body in which I can control my senses and can understand my destination. Therefore, I offer my respectful obeisances to the Supreme Personality of Godhead, by whom I have been blessed with this body and by whose grace I can see him within and without. So, the living entity in the womb was fortunate, he was able to see the Lord within and he understands the special benefit of having the human form of life, that it's an opportunity to actually perfect his existence. The other living entities, they have bodies, but they can only do things, as mentioned here, they can only act according to their instinct what is agreeable, what is for their sense gratification, then they, they're interested, they will come, they will look, they will smell, they will eat. 
right? And if they don't like it, then they find something else. Text number 20. Therefore, my Lord, although I am living in a terrible condition, I do not wish to depart from my mother's abdomen to fall again into the blind well of materialistic life. Your external energy called Deva Maya at once captures the newly born child and immediately false identification, which is the beginning of the cycle of continual birth and death, begins. So the soul the living entity in the womb understands is in a terrible condition. But, amazingly, initially he was praying to get out. Now he's saying, he said, let me stay here. I do not wish to depart from my mother's abdomen. Let me stay in this womb because I know if I leave, I'm going, it's going to be so difficult. The material energy, the Daiva Maya, captures the newly born child. One devotee explained it a very interesting way. He said, when the child is born, the child is crying. All the people are happy. The mother's happy, the father's happy, the, fam the relatives are all happy. The child has been born. But, Child is crying because child knows, oh, I've taken birth again, again a material body, again misery. And at the time of death, at the time of death, when the person is dying, all their relatives, the family, friends, every, they're crying. And the person who's dying, he's happy, he's going. I'm going now, I'm leaving this body. Bye-bye, I'll see you another time, some other place, maybe. And so at the time of death, the situation is reversed. The family who were so happy at birth, they're crying at death. And the soul who was taking birth, who was crying, he's happy when he dies. He's happy because he's thinking, I'm getting free of this material body. I'm getting free of all the miseries and all the problems which have been coming with this material body. So that's the benefit. Take birth again. Of course, we don't want to take birth again, but just to get free of one body, great relief. Prabhupada explains, this prayer of the child in the womb may be questioned by some atheistic people. How can a child pray in such a nice way in the womb of his mother? But Prabhupada explains, everything is possible by the grace of the Supreme Lord. The child is put into a precarious condition externally, but internally he is the same and the Lord is there by the transcendental energy of the Lord Everything is possible. Atheistic people, they can't accept, but a devotee can understand this very easily. And certainly the child is going to be praying. Whenever we're in danger, whenever there's a big problem, we pray. Even as children, when we had the exam results, we would pray, Oh, Krishna, give me a good mark. <laughs> we, whenever there's danger, we pray. Ra Radhana Swami describes there was a danger of an earthquake in the temple in Mumbai some years ago. So all the devotees rushed out of the temple and they were all chanting outside. And he said it was the best chanting they ever did. The best chanting because they didn't know if the ground is going to open up and swallow them or not. Their lives were in danger. So when the lives are in danger at that time, that's when we remember the Lord. It becomes easier for us. 
to think of the Lord. So the child in the womb, he's remembering the Lord and he offers these prayers. They're described to us by the grace of Srilaviyasati. Text 20 describes, I am suffering now, but when I take birth, I will immediately begin to identify with my body due to Maya's plan. I will then become a materialist and further extend my suffering. Better that I remain in this womb, despite my misery. Better just stay where I am. No need to leave the womb. Because leave the womb more misery. So better I just stay where I am. I'm, where I'm, I'm already, you get used to it. So let me stay here. We know Sukadeva Goswami was an impersonalist and he stayed in the womb of his mother for uh, 16 years before he took birth. And he only came out because he was convinced by hearing Srimad Bhagavatam. Text 21 describes, Therefore, without being agitated anymore, I shall deliver myself from the darkness of nations with the help of my friend, clear consciousness. Simply by keeping the lotus feet of Lord Vishnu in my mind, I shall be saved from entering into the wombs of many mothers for repeated birth and death. So the, the important instruction is here. Keep the lotus feet of Lord Vishnu. Keep the mind on the lotus feet of Lord Vishnu and that will save us from having to take birth again. So that attitude, that consciousness is very important. Always remember Krishna and if we can remember Krishna in the womb, then that's very great help. You don't need to take birth again. So. One may wonder that how we can worship the Lord in the womb. We don't have any paraphernalia. But Srila Prabhupada explains here from the purport, text 21, one does not need any material arrangement to cultivate consciousness. One can cultivate consciousness anywhere and everywhere, provided he can always think of the Maha Mantra. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, can be chanted even within the abdomen of one's mother. One can chant while sleeping, while working, while imprisoned in the womb or while outside. Consciousness cannot be checked in any circumstance. So an important point, we, can't, we shouldn't think that, oh, I can't chant here, oh, I can't remember Krishna here, oh, no, I'm, I'm in this situation, it's not, not good, not easy, I can't remember Krishna here. But anywhere, even within the womb, we can be chanting Hare Krishna and remembering Krishna. And in this way, we can save ourselves from all the miseries of the material world. Text 22, Lord Kapila continued, the ten-month-old living entity has these desires even while in the womb. But while he thus extols the Lord, the wind that helps parter, parter, parturition propels him forth with, with his face turned downward so that he may be born. So the child has to come out of the womb in a particular way. He has to come down head first, come out head first, 
And so Krishna arranges all this, special air in the body which forces the child to come down. Text 23, pushed downward all of a sudden by the wind, the child comes out with great trouble, head downward, breathless and deprived of memory due to severe agony. So, Srimad Bhagavatam tells us this condition at the time of birth. Head down, breathless. Child's born, the, sometimes the doctor has to take the child and slap it, spank it, to get some air into it, to get the child to start to breathe. And because the child has no breath. And the memory is gone, because it's such a fearful situation that everything is forgotten. Such a terrifying, difficult situation that memory just goes. And this way the child is coming into the material world. Text 24, the child thus falls on the ground, smeared with stool and blood, and placed just like a worm, gem germinated from the stool. He loses his superior knowledge and cries under the spell of Maya. So the child comes out of the womb and everything is forgotten, memory is gone, just crying. And this is, well he said, the people are happy, the child is born, but the child is not happy, the child is crying. He knows, oh another birth, again I've taken birth in this material world. Text 25 describes, after coming out of the abdomen, the child is given to the care of persons who are unable to understand what he wants. And thus, he is nursed by such persons. Unable to refuse whatever is given to him, he falls into undesirable circumstances. Because he's a little baby, a little child, so whatever is given to him he has to take. So the mother will give some bitter medicines, the child doesn't want medicine, there's nothing wrong with the child, but the mother thinks, I have to give the child this medicine to help his digestion, and she feeds him some bitter, horrible tasting medicine, and the child cries, and the mother thinks, oh, it's healthy, he's crying, his lungs will expand. It's often like that. This is at the time of birth and similarly at the time of death, similar situation. Before die, people are given all kinds of things, they may be given things to eat, they don't want them, but somehow they're, they're fed into them by force. Text 26, laid down on a foul bed, infested with sweat and germs, the poor child is incapable of scratching his body to get relief from his itching sensation, to say nothing of sitting up, standing or even moving. So the child has just come out of the womb, so he's not able to move very much yet, just a little bit motion in the body, just some wiggling, maybe a little scratching. Oh, it's, no, he's not even able to scratch. He's unable to scratch. He can't get relief from the itching of the body. So what can he do? What can he do? He's in that helpless condition, can't do anything. Text 27, in his helpless condition, Gnats, mosquitoes, bugs and other germs bite the baby whose skin is tender. Just as smaller worms bite a big worm, the child, deprived of his wisdom, cries bitterly. So the child is helpless, he cannot move, the skin is tender, 
So compared to this little worm biting the big worm. We're the little worms and Krishna is the big worm. <laughs> but within the material body, you do have worms living there. We try to avoid them. We don't want to become a worm ourselves. A bookworm. Read the books. The child, deprived of his condition, of his wisdom, cries bitterly. In this way, the child passes through his childhood, suffering different kinds of distress and attains boyhood. In boyhood also he suffers pain over desires to get things he can never achieve. And thus, due to ignorance, he becomes angry and sorry. So, the child begins to grow, comes to boyhood, and he has desires. He wants to do things, he wants to achieve things. Just like the young boys, you know, they often want to be sportsmen. Some young boys, they want to be football players. Some young boys, they want to be uh, basketball players. One devotee was telling me how in, in USA, there was this one young man he knew. He said, the young man, he, he really wanted to be a basketball player, but he was, he was very small in height. <laughs> so basketball players, they're all gigantic people. They're all like six foot plus. Then he was like five foot, maybe one or two inches. He was a small size man. And he was thinking to be a basketball player. He was always playing with a ball, a basketball, always practicing basketball. <laughs> how, how could he ever be a basketball player? It's impossible. So this is what happens. Young children, they have these desires, they want things, things they can never get. And this way they become sorry, and they become angry. So Prabhupada explains, not only children, but also elderly persons should be very careful to protect their sense of Krishna consciousness and avoid unfavorable circumstances so that they may not forget their prime duty. It's good for children, of course, the beginning of the life, if they can develop this consciousness in the beginning of the life. Prahlad Maharaj says, Kumaracharit Prakno Dharmam Bhagavatamiha. From the beginning of life, Kumar, develop your Krishna consciousness. But Old people also must be very careful because we know time is coming to an end. We have to leave the body. We have to protect our Krishna consciousness. We should only do things which are in relation to Krishna. Don't deviate from Krishna consciousness. Remember our duty. Save ourselves from maya. Jiva Goswami explains, not all children in the womb pray. Only some children will offer prayers. Don't think that every child in the womb is going to pray to Krishna. It won't happen. There, but there are some pious souls who, due to their previous lifetime, they had the consciousness to pray. They had the habit to pray. So these kind of children, these kind of living entities, who already had the habit of prayer, they take birth in the womb and they will pray. They will pray to the Lord. Not every child in the womb is praying to Krishna. But special children, special children. Text 29. With the growth of the body, the living entity, in order to vanquish his soul, 
increases his false prestige and anger and thereby creates enmity towards similarly lusty people. So the material world is being described. You grow up, you have some, may have some friends, but you have also some en enemies. Because you have pride, you have some also anger, and you make enemies, and you have difficulties dealing with people. Problems come. Conflicts, the material world always full of so many conflicts. Threat of war, globally, internationally, community-wise, always so many troubles. Text 30, by such ignorance the living entity accepts the material body made of five elements as himself. With this misunderstanding he accepts non-permanent things as his own and increases his ignorance in the darkest region. So the non-permanent, what is non-permanent, the, the non-permanent things, is, that everything we possess, our home, our car, our bank balance, it's all non-permanent. And even our body is not permanent. But we accept it as our own. We are thinking, this is mine, this is mine. What is ours? Nothing is ours. Text 31, for the sake of the body, which is a source of constant trouble to him, and which follows him because he is bound by ties of ignorance and fruit of activity, he performs various actions which cause him to be subjected to repeated birth and death. So this is the problem material life due to ignorance and fruit of activity. We want to enjoy, we want the fruit, we want to enjoy the results of our work and he will perform activities which are sinful, which will cause him to take birth again in the material world. A source of trouble, more trouble, more births in the material. So, due to bad association, text 32, if therefore the living entity again associates with the path of unrighteousness, influenced by sensually minded people engaged in the pursuit of sexual enjoyment and the gratification of the palate, he again goes to hell as before. So he came from hell, he came up to the human form of life and took a long time but somehow he got there to the human form of life. We've got the chance. Now what are we going to do? Are we going to go back again through all the hell? Are we going to get out? It's our choice but we get the result of our work. If we become lusty and sensual we will have to go to hell. So we're warned, be, beware of bad association. If one aspires to reach the culmination of yoga and has realized his self by rendering service unto me, he should never associate with an attractive woman. Right? For such a woman is declared in the scriptures to be the gateway of hell to hell for the advancing devotee. Now, for you ladies who are listening here, you ladies, you should read wherever it says woman, you should read man. One should never associate with an attractive man, for man is declared in the scriptures to be the gateway to hell for the advancing devotee. We have to recognize, this is a very powerful section in the Srimad Bhagavatam, very, very powerful. Lord Kapila's warning about the danger of the illicit connection with the opposite sex. And it's very good to hear it and to read it again, to understand. 
Lord Kapila says, just try to understand the mighty strength of my Maya in the shape of woman or in the shape of man, who by the mere movement of her or his eyebrows can keep even the greatest conquerors of the world under her grip or his grip. Very powerful, Maya, the opposite sex, the attraction to the opposite sex. We're all under the spell of the attraction to the opposite sex. Lord Kapila said, just the movement of the eyebrows and the, and the other member is, whoa, they're bewildered. So Lord Kapila warns, the trap of family life. The woman, or maybe man, created by the Lord, is a representation of Maya. And one who associates with such Maya, by accepting services, must certainly know that this is the way of death, just like a blind well covered with grass. Just like there's a well in the countryside, in the fields, they often, they make a well in the ground and they cover it, they just put some maybe little pieces of wood, a bit grass over it, they don't really take care. And so people can easily fall in and it's like death sometimes, they fall into the well. There may be no water even in the bottom of the well, so it's just like death how to get out. So the association with the opposite sex is like this. You get very attached that you want to remain in that condition. You want that companionship, that company. We become very absorbed in that company with the opposite sex. But it's not good. It's not good for our Krishna consciousness. You have to be very careful, very, very careful. So Srimad Bhagavatam warns us, beware of maya in the form of man or woman. Text 41, a living entity who as a result of attachment to a woman in his previous life, has been endowed with the form of a woman, foolishly looks upon Maya in the form of a man, her husband, as a bestower of wealth, progeny, house, and other material assets. So Lord Kapil is describing the woman. How did she get the woman's body? You have a woman's body today. Why do you have a woman's body? Because in your previous life you were a man and you were attached to a woman. So because you were a man in your previous life and you were attached to women, you were thinking about women. And, and the result is you become a woman in the next life, right? You become a woman. So this, this is, this, and the, when you become a woman, then the woman is thinking, I want a husband. So the woman who had been a man in her last life, now she's looking for a husband. So this is Maya. And she's thinking, she's thinking the husband will give me money, he'll give me children, she'll, he'll give me house, he'll take care of me. But we should understand that is very temporary. It's not going to last very long. Husband's going to give you a home. How long is it going to stay with you? Husband also has a material body. He's also going to die one day. He's going to give you children. They're not going to stay with you. They grow up, they go away. He will give you money. That money has less and less value every day. So many problems. Text 42, a woman should therefore consider her husband, 
her house and her children to be the arrangement of the external energy of the Lord for her death. Just as the sweet singing of the hunter is death for the deer. So the hunters, they will use something like that. They will make some sweet sound to attract the deers. And the deer will hear the sweet sound and they will become still. And in this way the hunter comes and he can kill the deer and take the deer. Very bad. So a woman should consider her husband and her children to be the energy of the Lord for her death. They are Krishna's maya, just to keep her in illusion. And Lord Kapila gives the example, just like the, this deer is captured by the sweet singing in the forest. So we don't want to get captured. First of all, you get the spouse, and then you get the children, and then you get the house. And this way you become very, very attached. And because we're very attached, very difficult to make spiritual advancement. All right? So now we're going to have a little group exercise. I've been talking a lot. So, we want... How many people have we got here today? 59 devotees, Maharaj. 59 devotees? Oh my God. 30, 39. 39, okay. Okay, so 39, 40... It's about uh, one, two, three groups, uh, uh, three, could be six, four, five people in a group, right? Can you make groups of five? Okay, Maharaj, Hare Krishna, Madhavaganda Prabhu can help me to make a group? Okay. Yeah. Okay, Prabhu, I will meet you as a host. Actually, okay. five. It should be six. Six in a group. Maybe six, six in a group because we, we want six, six groups, right? Okay. Hare six. Krishna and the Hukanta Prabhu. Six into okay. forty. Yeah, Prabhu, one minute. I'm, I'm trying to do it. Uh, okay. Right, you can see the different exercises, different groups. 38 to 40, takes for 38 to 40, takes 41, and takes 32 to 39. We want you to discuss and explain to us, right? If Maybe maybe we won't hear from every we won't hear from everybody today. Well, we will. We still got time. Yeah. Okay. We'll give you ten, fifteen minutes to discuss this. Have you made six groups? So group one will be Jagannath group, and group two will also be Jagannath group. And group three and group four will be Baladev group. And group five and group six will be Subhadra group. Right? So group one and two, association of women as the gateway to hellish life. Dis discuss. Let me hear what's your conclusion. Baladev group. The body of a man has greater opportunity to get out of the material clutches. You have to discuss. Let's hear. What is your conclusion? Subhadra group. Women are the wonderful creation of Maya to keep, to keep the conditioned soul in shackles. Discuss. Base 32, 39. So that will be group 5 and 6, Subhadra group, Baladev group, group 3 and 4. And Jagannath group one and two. Okay, have you put everybody in a group, Prabhu? Okay, yes, Maharaj, six group. Okay, oh. six groups, very good. 